Let's learn about batch normalization and why it's the secret weapon of deep learning. In this video, we will talk about how it works. We will also learn the benefits of using batch normalization. And lastly, we will look into the code, a Keras code of how we can implement it in our notebooks. So let's jump right into it. All right, first things first, what is normalization? So there are a bunch of definitions of normalization. Uh, there's normalization and standardization. Standardization sometimes is also called normalization. So you might see them or hear them used interchangeably. But just so you know, normalization normally means collapsing the values so that they are between zero and one, whereas standardiz standardization would mean uh, changing the numbers so that the mean, they, their mean is zero, their average is zero, and their variance is one. So let's look at like a small brief example. If you have three numbers that go from zero to 100, let's say the first one is like five, we have 75 and 98. Uh, then we would have to shrink them and we would have to scale them down so that they are between zero and one, but they will keep the relationship that they have to each other. For standardization, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Then if we have the same numbers, what's going to happen is that we're going to put them in such a place so that their mean will be zero, but also their standard deviation or variance will be one. What that means is they... 34.1% of the numbers that we have, well, we only have three right now, so it might not be much, <laughs> but the majority of the numbers will be between minus one and one. And then a little bit more, a little bit less of it is going to be between minus two and minus one and one and two. And as you go further, we're going to have less and less numbers. So it, given that we are doing a normal distribution, why do we do normalization? So normalization is something that we do normally uh, before we pass the inputs to our neural network. So if this is our neural network, it's going to accept two inputs and then it's going to uh, calculate things in the hidden layer and then give us an output. Uh, we need to scale things down or scale things to the same scale before we give it to the neural network. So let's say we have uh, one feature that goes from 0 to 1, so the values could be 0 0.5, 0 0.68, 0 0.9, etc. We have another one that goes from 3 to 24. You know, this could be like number of houses owned, for example. Um, we might have another one, so it could go from 0 to 1,000. This could be like amount of money in the bank account right now. Uh, so as you can see, they all have very different scales and we before we put it on neural network, the best practice is to scale them or normalize them or standardize them uh, before you pass it to your neural network. And why we do that is because if we don't do it, we are going to have uh, an unstable network. And what that means is we might have some weights that are going to be very high and some weights that are going to be very low. And this might cause in turn either the exploding gradient, gradients problem or the vanishing gradients problem. So that's why we want our inputs to be uh, same, normalized and in the same scale. How does batch normalization come into play? So what we do to stop the unstable gradients problem or uh, vanishing or exploding gradients problem is to normalize our inputs. We also need to make sure that we select the correct uh, weight initialization technique. We also want to make sure that we are using the correct activation function. But at the end of the day, this problem can still occur in our neural network. So researchers came up with a solution which is called batch normalization. And what we do is we don't only normalize our input, but we normalize everything that comes out of any layer before it goes into the next layer. And basically what happens is then we have some extra layer. It will look like extra layers in between the hidden layers of our network. So whatever this little neuron outputs, we first uh, normalize it and then we pass it on to the next layer. So let's see how it will work. Let's see, we have, let's, let's say we have this input that either came from the previous layer or it's, it's our first input. If the values are from three to 24, we have three, five, eight, nine, 11, and 24. So first what batch normalization, normalization does is to normalize them as we talked about. So it normalizes them, uh, calculates the number that they should be. And in this case, then we will have a mean of zero 
and the standard deviation of 1. But it doesn't stop there. The last step is to change the values a little bit. So we either rescale them or we offset them. So what that means is we uh, multiply them with a number and then we also add some number to them. And these numbers are going to be trained during training to have their most optimal value. So these are trainable parameters that we have in our network. Uh, let's see how this works. So as I said, this is a normalized version of our original values. And if we, let's say, want to rescale them by two, we basically multiply them by two, right? And then this is what we would have. If we want to offset them, then the, what it would mean is it's going to be moving on the axis that it's on. So if we say, let's offset them by 0 0.5, then we're going to move them a little bit to the right. So that's how it would work. Um, this actually best normalization technique works very well with dealing with the unstable gradients problem, but it also has some other benefits. So what are those? we can achieve the same accuracy that we achieve without batch normalization much faster in a much faster way. And it can most of the time lead to a better performance. We don't need to also, if we add a batch normalization layer before the inputs, so we don't need to do the standardization. I'll show you that in the code in a second. Uh, when you use batch normalization, you also don't need to use regularization techniques. Regularization is something that we use to avoid overfitting in neural networks, but using batch normalization actually reduces the need to do regularization. But of course, you're going to have to see that for your own network and see if you still need regularization or not. And lastly, it actually makes the learning a little bit faster, or at least training a little bit faster. What happens is even though there are some extra calculations in between layers and it might slow down the epochs, uh, single epochs, at the end, your model will converge faster to a uh, optimum. So then you, maybe you will, less, you will need less epochs. And at the end, um, you will have to wait less time for your model to be trained. So let's go and take a look at the code. Uh, today, I'm going to show you the example of the classic MNIST data set. Uh, uh, here, I'm basically reading my data. What we have, the inputs that we have is a 28 to 28 uh, pixel data image. So what I normally do in this case is, so this image has pixels, right? And each of these pixels have a value. And if the value is zero, then we don't have any information, it's black. The higher the number that we have in this pixel, the brighter the or the lighter the color of the image. So then I will, you know, this one is probably like 70, 80, and then this is higher, and the completely white ones are 255. So what do I do if I am not using batch normalization on the first layer is I have to divide the values by 255 to normalize them. So then the values will be between 0 and 1. Uh, but this is again, as I said, if I don't use batch normalization, and then what I do here is I basically create my neural network, but right now it doesn't have batch normalization. How can I add batch normalization to this? Well, it's very simple. Basically, all you have to do is add this. It's a layer from Keras. It's called batch normalization. <laughs> and you can do it's Keras that layers a batch normalization, and then you have to put it after your layers, after your hidden layers. But if you also want to um, process your inputs with the batch normalization layer, again, after flattening them, after changing this uh, 28 to 28 metrics to a one long 784 uh, element list, then you need to do batch normalization on top of it. And then it basically uh, normalizes things for you. So you don't have to do it before here. So it would have to like, comment this out. Um, one other detail about implementing batch normalization is there is some research out there that claims that it is actually better to do batch normalization before putting the output through uh, activation and activation function. So if you remember from studying neural networks, what happens is you get, let's, let's, I'll show you here. Uh, we have some sort of input, right? Let's call it X. And your input is um, multiplied by a weight and a bias is added to it. And then this is 
put through a activation function and then this will give you the output. So what they say is instead of putting ho this whole thing into the batch normalization, put this in the batch normalization and then run the activation function. But it's not really uh, proven or it's not always the case in each problem. So you might this might be something that you want to try and figure out if it makes uh, your performance better uh, for your specific problem or for a specific neural network. And also you have to remember that this uh, really works with bigger networks by normalization. If you have a small network like this, you will very likely not see a big difference in performance. Um, so to do uh, the batch normalization before the activation, what we have to do is we have to separate the activation from the layer. So then I will delete the activation from here. So it will not have an activation function. And then I would add it here. Um, so, and also one last thing that you need to do is you need to not have bias because it doesn't really make sense because what you're doing is, so this is how you calculate the output of a layer. Well, now you're saying, okay, I'm not going to have activation. Well, now you have this. So this is your output, right? And this is the output that you give to batch normalization. Well, batch normalization calculates something on top of it. And then it also, if you remember here, it also uh, adds an offset. So you don't have to have an offset and a bias. So at the end, you can just let go of the bias and just use the offset, just train the offset. Uh, so that's why it, the best practice is to not use bias if you separate the uh, activation from the layer and have a batch normalization in between. Uh, you can do it for the other ones too, if you like, and that way you will be using the batch normalization before uh, you put the activation. And it's actually as simple as this. I mean, thank God for Keras <laughs> or thank the developers, let's say, for <laughs> Keras because they make everything very simple. This was batch normalization. If you want to learn more about deep learning and all the topics involving deep learning, you should go check out my course. I will leave the link in the description. Uh, it, by the time I'm making this video, it's not out yet. So if it's still not out, you can leave your email address and you, feel you can be one of the first people to know about the course when it comes out. And if it's already out, I will highly suggest you go and check it out and maybe enroll in it. It will be a very practical course, very hands-on, but we will learn everything that we need to know need to know in the theory of deep learning. But for now, if you like this video, I would love it if you give me a thumbs up or maybe even subscribe to be one of the first people to know when my videos come out. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed this video. Have a nice day and I'll see you later.